Okay, let's get started. Everyone have your pizza and, and ready to go. So um, I'm gonna talk for just a, a few minutes to set the stage uh, and hopefully you all realize the extraordinary importance of the issue that is the subject of Professor Sanger's talk today. But I just want, I can't resist emphasizing it and, and just telling you about a couple things I think you should be sure to pay attention to in the news. Then I'm gonna turn it over to our Feminist Law Forum President Annie Mose, who will be doing the formal introduction and saying a few words about an event that occurred here in Bloomington yesterday, the screening of the film Jackson, um, that uh, our wonderful new chapter of Now, for, uh, Monroe County Now um, hosted. Did anyone get to see that? Raise your hand. I'm just wondering how much overlap we have. Okay, a few people. Annie will just fill you in a little bit about what, what that was about. I'm talking in this mic that's not making me louder, but it is, I guess, taping it. So, um, so I, I will do that. So it is um, really a tremendous privilege uh, to um, do the informal welcome and introduction of Professor Carol Sanger, uh, about whom I've known for a long time and admired her work, but this has been my first opportunity to meet her. And so I'm so glad. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the formal thank yous, but I wanted to thank um, just uh, in particular Shruti Rana for, um, Shruti's here somewhere, for the work in, in bringing Professor uh, Carol Sanger here to Bloomington. Um, really wonderful to have you. And um, also want to give a little plug for her amazing new book about abortion, terminating pregnancy in 21st century America, just out. Um, so I... Um, you know, I encourage you all to um, read it and to just really increase your attention to this, uh, um, you know, issue never been more important than now to pay attention to the assault on women's reproductive health. Um, and I'm sure that you're, you're aware of that. How could you not be with um, so much going on, assault on um, contraception and, and abortion? Um, and also some really difficult questions about how we live in a society of different views, different religious beliefs, different moral beliefs, um, and a fundamental constitutional commitment to women's equality and liberty. Um, you know, that can make for some tough questions. So I, I wanted to start by just setting the stage for why I think this is a particularly vital time for us all to pay attention. And sometimes people talk about um, abortion fatigue or, you know, like this is the issue that just won't go away for decades, generations. And uh, it's something that I've been working on very um, uh, directly, um, you know, at least since the 80s, and just never thought we would be um, where we are today. You know, I'll just put my cards on the table and say, you know, I was, I was really thinking back in the 80s when I was working at NARAL and, and the ACLU that um, we would be in a position of greater respect for women being able to make their own choices uh, about when and whether to have children, um, but not to be. And so I just want to mention two, two things by way of introduction about why this is such an important time. One, I was in D.C. last Thursday, and I had been invited to come and talk to a group of reproductive health professionals and researchers primarily um, about a question, it took me back a little, you know, they said, what are we going to do when the Supreme Court overrules Roe, and how should we be getting ready? You know, and that was my topic. And I said, I actually want to reframe that a little, because I'm not sure the court's ever going to say it's overruling Roe, and we shouldn't um, create the expectation that that's how it will happen. But so what I talked about is, um, how many of you know the case Whole Women's Health out of Texas? Do you remember that? Just recent um, decision where the Supreme Court struck down very onerous abortion clinic regulations in Texas that had had the effect of shutting down over three quarters of the clinics. Um, and I think the movie Jackson is, is right on point and I don't want to preempt what, what Annie's about to tell you about. But um, you know, I think what we have to prepare ourselves for is um, Holman's Health, there were five justices in the majority and now President Trump gets to point the next Supreme Court justices. And so, you know, the question is, and, and there are rumors that Justice Kennedy hasn't hired his clerks yet um, for the upcoming year. So people in D.C. are all abuzz about whether Justice Kennedy, who is one of the five in the majority, um, would um, be retiring. And so, you know, that's the question 
when President Trump appoints, um, nominates, and and then you know most likely will be able to appoint the next justice, uh, whether it's Justice Kennedy, Justice Ginsburg, you know, and one of the justices in the five. And if the court is going to decide cases like Coleman's Health um, against um, the what I think is the clear right way to apply Roe versus Wade and and Planned Parent versus Casey. That means states like Mississippi, Texas, you know, many others with um, very challenging political situations um, can enact laws that will not say abortion is a crime, but will make it, as a practical matter, unavailable in that state just as effectively as if the court did expressly overrule Roe. You know, so that I think we need to be thinking about. What's America, America going to look like then and prepare for that? And the second thing, um, and I'll turn over um, to Annie, is... Did you follow um, the story, the, the terrible, tragic saga of the undocumented 17-year-old from Texas, Jane Doe? Um, you know, so that's what it's going to look like. And, and it's going to start the, the – um, and it's not over. So that I just want to say keep following that. The, um, uh, you know, ba just quickly, 17-year-old uh, young woman, nine weeks pregnant, undocumented, in U.S. custody, wanted to terminate her pregnancy. Very clear about that, and the Trump administration fought it and 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 wouldn't allow her to to um, leave government custody and make it possible for her to do that um, until you know 16 weeks. Um, or, so that's uh, that's seven weeks. That's a long time in a pregnancy to be dealing with an abortion. And so finally, the ACLU lawyers prevailed in the D.C. Court of Appeals on Bank. And she terminated her pregnancy. She had an abortion. And now, you know, young lawyers out there, now the Trump administration, Jeff Sessions, Attorney General, and the Solicitor General are seeking to vacate the opinion and seeking sanctions against the ACLU lawyer for not telling them when exactly she was having the abortion so they could try to get the Supreme Court to stop it. Um, you know, so that's bullying. That is inappropriate. I worked at the Justice Department for five years, you know, and that is not appropriate. All the stories say extraordinary. Um, so that is something that um, I think is, you know, this women who are most vulnerable and they're lawyers, you know, and, and that's one thing we're going to have to prepare for is what's the role for, for lawyers in, in a world effectively without the protections of, of the courts, productive rights. So, um, Great. Let me now just say uh, thank you and welcome so much uh, to, to Carol and ask Annie to come up and do the formal introduction. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? <laughs> you could hear that. Um, okay. Hi. As Professor Johnson said, my name is Annie Mose. I am a 2L here at Mauer, um, the current president of the Feminist Law Forum. I'm also a member of Law Students for Reproductive Justice and a member of the Monroe County now chapter, National Organization for Women. Uh, this event is co-sponsored by Monroe County Now, uh, the Department of Gender Studies, the American Constitution Society, Law Students for Reproductive Justice, and the Feminist Law Forum. Um, I'm honored to help introduce Professor Carol Sanger. Professor Sanger is the Barbara Ehrenstein Black Professor of Law at Columbia Law School. She teaches courses on contracts, family law, and others focusing on reproduction, the legal profession, and law and gender. She recently published the book about abortion, Terminating Pregnancy in the 21st Century. The book discusses the regulation of abortion, maternal conduct, surrogacy, and the law's relation to culture. She has also edited the eighth edition of Cases and Materials on Contracts. In addition to her fellowships and her awards for her teaching, in 2011, the Center for Reproductive Rights honored her with an Innovations in Scholarship Award. And in 2013, she received the Green Bag Award for Exemplary Legal Writing. Uh, for the article, The Birth of Death, Stillborn Birth Certificates and the Problem for Law. Yesterday evening, I was fortunate to attend a screening of the documentary film Jackson, which focused on the single abortion clinic still operating in the state of Mississippi. Mississippi is one of the most volatile states for women's rights and health with many politicians openly campaigning on outlawing abortion and virtually no sex education being offered in schools. The film was followed by a panel with Professor Sanger, State Senator Jean Bro, and local medical student Josh Vollmer. <laughs> 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 
on that panel, Professor Sanger touched upon the distinction between privacy and secrecy surrounding abortion that she will also discuss today. A recent review of Professor Sanger's book about abortion by Katie Klebusich in Rewire included a statement by Ms. Klebusich that said, this is the abortion book I didn't realize I was waiting for. Now, I have not yet read Professor Sanger's book, but I plan to. And I felt a similar sentiment to Ms. Klebusich's as I listened to her speak last night in the frame of the multiple state regulations that were forcing the Mississippi Clinic in Jackson um, to close yet again, almost. Um, as I listened to her speak about the systems of discouragement on a woman's right to choose and the secrecy adopted by so many to prevent the harms of disclosure, I also felt a similar corollary to the state of affairs in Indiana, the state in which I grew up. I am excited to introduce Professor Sanger today to share more of this scholarship of the stigma and silence encompassing sexuality and abortion and the connections this has to the anti-abortion legislation that continues to pour out of state houses. Please join me in welcoming the professor. Thank you. I want to see if there's anything else I can drop before I begin. Um, so I'm not, I, I, I have prepared remarks, although these aren't the prepared remarks I had prepared. I left those in the B&B. &B. Um, so these are the draft of the prepared remarks. But I thought I would begin just by responding to what you said about possible overturn of Roe. And I know that that's what everybody's waiting for, although I agree with you that, it'd be, that it'll take a couple of cases before that even becomes the issue, because it'd be much more easy to rewind parts of whole women's health and say, oh, that only applies in Texas, Texas is a big state, Think there are ways of cabining the decision in whole women's health. But I have another take on this, which is I don't think Roe is going to be over, I don't think abortion is going to be recriminalized. And I'm just putting this out there so you can have something to believe in, um, <laughs> even, if, even if it seems remote. But here are my two pieces of evidence. So every time there's criminal abortion statutes, they criminalize it for the doctors. There was a little bit of criminalization of women in some states um, and, and, uh, uh, for, for just having an abortion, not, not self-aborting, but just having an abortion. And so the reason that's given for that is that um, um, women shouldn't be held responsible because women shouldn't be held responsible for any kind of moral decision. Women are more like children, like they, they, they are under the influence of strong men, and that's why they had an abortion, not because they really wanted to do this thing. And I'll say more about this later. So when I think about what, so that's the story. That's the, and, so there's maybe something to that. But I think there's more to it, which is the reason I, and this ties in with my, my, my focus on privacy and secrecy, the reason I think women aren't included in and aren't arrested is nobody really wants to see mom doing, going down to the who's gal in cuffs. And I think that people are aware, as much as we don't think we know anybody who has had an abortion, we know we might. And that would, since one, the numbers are one in three, one on three women will have had an abortion by the end of their reproductive years. And I did a calculation, and, and so there are 700,000 women a year uh, who, have, who have an abortion now. That's down from a hundred, from a million, 200,000, which is a good thing. And most people think it's down, <clears throat> not particularly because of a strong pro-life propaganda, but because of um, better use of birth control. But so we need to know about that. But so we see, so, th so that's one point, but my, uh, the, the, why don't we arrest women? Other countries do. South and Central America arrest women and put them in jail, Ireland. So, uh, uh, no, I take it back, Ireland did, but no longer. The other piece that I want to say has to do with Mississippi exactly, which is a number of states have had on their, as referenda, so on the popular vote, de you know, democratic lawmaking, um, a personhood amendment. We're going to amend the constitution of our proud state to say that uh, con uh, personhood, legal personhood, begins at, um, at conception. 
And in the last three states that have had it, they have all voted it down, including Mississippi. Now, what's that about? I, I think it's about some idea that maybe we actually don't want to declare you know, a four cell entity, which is human, um, to be a legal person. And, and it could be that people are imagining maybe they'll have reproductive problems in later years and want to create some em embryos for um, in vitro fertilization, maybe, in, and, and have too many, and they'll have to decide what to do with them. So I think there's a little bit of hope in the fact that Mississippi voters, not the politicians, but the voters, decided against a personhood amendment. So I would put that in your, I have nothing to look forward to, bucket. Um, yeah, okay. Now, what I plan to do today, and it's really not 120, is it? This clock is wrong. Yeah, well, good, okay. <laughs> okay, that would explain, yeah, okay, no, no. Okay, just, yeah, all right. Um, I bought a new watch for the occasion, and it has, it has a second hand that looks like the minute hand, and it also has the logo of the watch going across like this, so it's a four-handed watch, and I can never tell what time it is, so very big mistake. So what I want to do today is explain um, how I, why I wrote the book, what its purpose is, me, um, talk specifically about privacy and secrecy, which I think has to do, and, and show how the law is implicated in, in this social dilemma, in this cultural picture I'm gonna paint. And my book is really not like a law book. You can actually give it to people for Christmas. You know, it would, um, you, it's easy to read. Would you, it's, it's easy to read, although it's printed in very tiny type. So I wouldn't give it to grandmothers. Um, <laughs> but, um, that was a surprise to me. And then I'd like to just, after I give a brief introduction, read a little from the book so you'll know what the book sounds like and what my, and where I stand or where the book stands. Okay, so I began, th I teach family law among contracts. I don't know if any of you use our contracts book, Farnsworth it's often called. Oh yeah, good. Um, <laughs> um, I always like that. Um, I, that when I teach family law, there isn't much time in family law because it's a jam-packed class to do a lot on reproduction, or at least the number of hours um, Columbia gives it. And so where, where abortion is taught is in constitutional law, you know, the grand classes where you, where you do intellectual stuff as opposed to family law. And I decided this is a huge mistake because when I do teach an abortion seminar and when I get students in there, they... <clears throat> they know the doctrine really well. They know where abortion law fits into privacy and, and they know about whole women's health and so on. But what they have no conception is of the practices of abortion that exist in the US today and how the law, in my view, has a great deal to do with those, those practices. So I wrote it, I, I, wrote, I began thinking at the beginning of the first Obama administration, administration, time to step up and think about how abortion works. What is this relation between abortion law and abortion culture, between abortion law and abortion practices, what people actually do? And um, so that's, that's, when I, that's when I just made myself, I, I got in, I decided to take up the issue and try to write about things that people hadn't really written about before. So with regard to abortion, so it's not a doctrinal book. Um, okay, so, let me just see. Yeah, and the other thing was why that was a good time for me was I thought, okay, we're in the Obama administration. We've got eight years in which, when which um, Roe wasn't gonna be overturned. We're hardly even gonna talk about it. So there was like, for all people interested in the subject, you could have like a little rest. You, could, you knew the states were gonna keep going to town and passing trap laws and every other kind of law they could. But from a constitutional perspective, it was like, a holiday. And so I thought eight years, and then I thought, oh, eight will become you know, 16, and 16 will become 24. And we know that's not how things turned out. Instead, um, we know that Vice President Pence has pledged to consign Roe versus Wade to the ash heap of history where it belongs. And the federal government, having made serious inroads into the integrity of our environment and um, our national immigration policy, has now turned its sights in the last month ferociously to not just abortion, but contraception. And, um, and they'll probably outlaw dating soon, you know. So, so um, but 
and, and, and so we have, th that's where we stand now. And the interesting part, as Don said, is that now the federal government is becoming very involved. Most recently the House passed, a, the House only, passed a 20 week um, abortion ban, no ban, no abortions after 20 weeks, and it's called the fetal pain bill, because that's when it is alleged by the proponents of the bill that um, that's when a fetus can feel pain. Now, one of the benefits of Whole Women's Health was they said, you can't just say things anymore. You have to prove them. And so uh, certainly the medical s story is 24 weeks at the earliest. Some say 26 at the earliest. So that's a, that we'll put to the side right now. So I think this is a very good time for me just to read the first three paragraphs of the book. Um, this is just in the preface. So any book about abortion necessarily begins in the middle of the story. This is because the problem of an unwanted pregnancy does not start with abortion. Abortion follows pregnancy, whether that pregnancy has been much sought after and is highly desired, or whether it is the worst thing ever. Pregnancy, in its turn, follows sexual intercourse, whether that intercourse was calculated, casual, or coerced. Um, to say that abortion falls in the middle of things is to say that abortion is located at a discrete intersection at a woman, in a woman's life. On the one side, there is pregnancy. On the other side, there is non-pregnancy and the status quo with regard to the number of children she has. A mother of two remains a mother of two. A girl does not become a mother. Second paragraph. This is not to say that a woman's life necessarily proceeds exactly as it would have had there been no pregnancy and no abortion, although many lives do. For some women, abortion registers as a profound loss. The date or projected birth date reflected upon, sometimes commemorated for years to come. For many others, however, the core reaction is one of relief and the welcome return of the preferred, at least for now, uh, non-pregnant self that almost got away. Still other women experience both relief, the most widely reported emotion following an abortion, and some form of regret, not regret in the sense that you do it, if you got a do-over, you change your mind, but regret in the sense of wistfulness, um, a shame that the circumstances around the pregnancy, partner, finances, obligations, plans, were just not right enough to proceed. Last paragraph. In this way, every abortion has a context, a set of befores and imagined afters that inform how women's decisions about abortion are made and how they are experienced. It's as though on the chronological spectrum of a woman's life, a notional pushpin has been um, planted on the spot marking the decision. And that same pin marks the subject of this book, how women confront and decide about unwanted pregnancy within the complicated structures of constraint, personal, cultural, legal, that frame the issue of abortion in modern America. So that gives you a sense of where I, where I start from. And I guess I should say I had two other framing commitments or priors. Do you hear people talking about priors? It's, I, when I first heard it, I thought, and I'd like to tell you my priors. I thought, I don't want to hear your priors. But anyway, it just means your pre-existing commitments. Professors use it, so watch out. Um, the arguments in abor about abortion were framed by two commitments. The first was that I accept that abortion is legal. I'm not arguing about whether it should be legal or not. It is legal. Not only is it legal, it's a right. So it's activity that we assign special significance to. Um, and think it should only be taken away under the rarest of circumstances. Um, I also don't discuss the morality of abortion. Um, that is something the law quite prudently leaves to every woman, woman herself to decide. In the United States, there's no compulsory abortion. So it's, it's, a, it's a decision. Um, now the second commitment is that and this is a very important one with regard to the law, that women understand, women and even young women, that teenagers, understand what abortion is and what it does. If a pregnant woman has an abortion, she knows that some months hence she will not have a baby. You have to like put it just that simply. Ending pregnancy is the very point of an abortion. 
and that necessarily means ending a particular form of prenatal life, whether embryonic or fetal. Now, for some, this is an outright killing, and for others, it isn't. But I want to reject the idea that women do not understand what they are doing and that they must be informed over and over and over again through increasingly inventive laws that prenatal life in any form is just the same as a living person sitting here. I will make an aside. There was a fabulous, well, there was an interesting case in California. A woman was driving in the high occupancy vehicle lane <laughs> just by herself. So she got pulled over by a cop, and she said, there are two of us in this car. <laughs> and the judge says, not for the purpose of the high occupancy vehicle line. <laughs> so as I, you find interesting things when you start to look. Um, so what are these ways that women are told over and over again? Um, the, the, the easiest one to talk about is mandatory ultrasound laws, which say that you have to have an ultrasound before you uh, have an abortion. And so here I stop to say many doctors think you should have an ultrasound beha before you have an abortion so that the pregnancy can be located and it can be timed to make sure that it isn't beyond the, the time limit, the chronological time limit. But that's a different matter than having it for legal purposes of making sure you have informed consent. So what are you being informed about? Well, they say, would you like to see the picture of your unborn child? So that gives you a little information right there, what you're supposed to be seeing. Um, and some people look, and some women don't look. Uh, with, when, it is, when it's done simply for medical reasons, many physicians say, would you like to see the screen? And some women look, and some women don't look. Um, but it is rarely a game changer. Um, people don't change their mind about, about an abortion based on what they see. Now, I think that this is a clever and actually a very diabolical requirement in that it commandeers a process that is used in wanted pregnancies. You probably know from friends or uh, sisters or someone that, that what the first ultrasound is a very exciting moment. It's something that couples look forward to. We're going to see our baby. Um, and what, this, what these requirements do is commandeer this practice for wanted pregnancies and pull it over to women with unwanted pregnancies and say, try this on for size. So you know, you're lying on the table and you know how you're supposed to feel. The culture has already told you how you're supposed to respond to, to this happy sight. But it's not a happy sight, and necessarily. Or, uh, and I want to say the difference between an unwanted pregnancy and a wanted pregnancy is very fluid. A wanted pregnancy can be un become unwanted very quickly. You get a phone call from your boyfriend who says, sorry, honey, I'm not in for this, or you lose your job, or you um, get a bad pre prenatal diagnosis. So these are all reasons that can make a wanted pregnancy go the other way. And there are a few cases where it can f flip back to wanted, but we see that this is not a fast category at all. Okay, and I would call... Um, these requirements n having no they're nothing to do with medically informed consent. I think what they're after is morally informed consent. And that seems to me not the place for law to take a stand. Um, and if you didn't understand by being told you have to look at the ultrasound, and in a number of states, you have to, the physician has to read out a script showing you extremities, organs, skull, any identifiable part. Um, and, and so that's been upheld in, in um, that's been upheld in the Fifth Circuit and rejected in the Fourth Circuit, who said this is making this is compelled speech for physicians. So physicians won on that case, not women, but physicians, and that's okay. Um, but that's some that's a, a case that could well go to that issue could well go to the Supreme Court. Um, but there's another one. If you didn't understand from being told you could look at the ultrasound which is um, you're also told before you have the abortion that you will have to bury or cremate fetal remains afterwards. Okay, so we're showing you that what the abortion is operating on is must be treated like a person. That's what we do with persons. We respect burial, um, we, you know, we expect disposal of human remains. And so it's, it's a message that has nothing to do with medicine because the, thing will, the, the procedure will have already happened. Okay, 
Um, and so my view is that these kinds of laws, um, are, are, are the, the legislatures are thinking something like this. Yeah, yeah, we've read Roe v. Wade. We know we can't ban abortion, although we can unconstitutionally ban it at 16 weeks or 20 weeks. We can do that. Nobody's tested that yet. Um, but even though we can't prohibit you, we can't criminalize it, we can make you pay. And we can make you pay by making abortion harder to get, harder legally, harder emotionally, harder financially, and harder practically. And so I th think there's a very punitive strain to these laws. Okay. Now, in light of such regulations, we can understand why some women who terminate a pregnancy feel that they have done something that's borderline criminal. And this explains why and, and a major purpose of my book is to show that to the extent women feel ashamed or guilty or reticent to speak about an abortion at the level of personal experience, they might be heartened to know that there's an entire structure of American law and culture that is aimed at bringing about exactly that result. It's not an inevitable thing. It's not, uh, yeah, so the, I'll, it, it, is, it is a structured thing. It has been, we know how we're supposed to feel, not because it's a biological fact, but because the law ha and culture play back and forth with this. Okay. So let's turn to women's reticence to speak, because despite the statistics who show we have, you know, three quarters of a million women doing this every year, many people think they don't know anyone who's ever terminated a pregnancy. Um, and that, what, what the effect of that is that we don't know, as family members, as citizens, and as constituents, the the we don't we don't think we know anyone who's had an abortion, and we are underinformed about the practices of abortion, who has them, why they have them, how they make the decision, what their story is, and what this means is that the dominant cultural narrative of who has an abortion. A woman who has, is careless about contraception, a woman who probably, if she's a teenager, has too much sex, a woman who is innately selfish because she's putting herself above, ev above her, her pregnancy. And um, that, that is kind of the dominant narrative about who has it when you talk about it. And this is how people distance themselves because certainly no one we know knows anybody who's contraceptively careless has too much sex, or whatever the third one was. And I, I wanted to just show you, um, this is a picture by, so part of the book, the book has illustrations. And they are many, most of them are taken from art or sculpture. Um, and this, I just wanted to show you this. This is a picture from 1892 by Edward Munch, you know, the scream guy. And guy, all right, yeah, he, all right. And so um, I, I, I looked for all the pictures in art or in re representations of fetuses. And there are, there are many that go right up to now that are incredibly interesting. But I hope you, I don't know if you can see, here's the little fetus. And do you see the sperms? I just thought it was a pretty frame, you know, but there it is, pretty design. <laughs> And so we have this picture of what, of what a woman who has an abortion looks like. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, now, so, uh, so let's go, I wanna look at some of the actual practices that make up non abortion non-disclosure, or what I think of as abortion silence. Um, women don't tell their friends, except maybe a very good one who will drop them off or pick them up afterwards. Young women don't often, tell their, often don't tell their parents. Mothers rarely tell their children. And wives don't always tell their husbands, although most do. Um, the exception is when there's a relationship involving domestic violence. Then there's no disclosure. Even in pro-choice families, the news can be unexpected and unsettling. One, one, one woman described in an op-ed piece in the time, New York Times how after her middle-aged mother confided as the young woman was on her way to college that she, the mother, had had an illegal abortion in 1972, quote, it took a few years for the shock to wear off. The daughter had thought that a right to abortion was something only other women needed, not my family and certainly not my mother. And in terms of telling, there's, I just have to read you one one other example of telling on what, what this, ah, on what this 
woman described as a need-to-know basis. Yeah, she only told people on a need-to-know basis. My lover who impregnated me, the man I lived with and later married, a friend who loaned me money, women who helped me locate a cr clinic, and finally, in an only-on-the-left moment, the entire steering committee of a strike I was involved with during the course of an argument about who could afford to be arrested. I couldn't risk civil disobedience and miss the clinic appointment. So there we have a little lefty disclosure. OK, now, many women with insurance pay out of pocket so the procedure won't go into the insurer's computerized database. Women with family doctors don't always tell them, but travel further away to somewhere else where they won't be known. Even clinic waiting rooms risk exposure. As one patient explained, you don't want to know who's here, you don't want to be recognized, and you don't want to see them ever again. And consider signing up with a, this is, this is something women may know, but when you sign up with a new gynecologist, you move to a new town, um, you often have to fill out a reproductive history, and two questions are always there. How, how many pregnancies have you had, and how many live births? And my hunch, although I haven't been able to really study this yet, is that that's not always filled out accurately. <laughs> because you're just meeting your new doctor. You really don't want to, you don't, you, there's, it's your new doctor. Let's start with a, let's start anew. Um, okay. Now, one way to describe these various forms of concealment is as an exercise of privacy. And by privacy, I mean information that falls within a zone of personal control that is the person's alone to reveal. Not because it must be hidden, but because it is no one else's business. And despite our hugely indiscreet and confessional culture, just stand anywhere uh, and listen, there is an, still an established right notion of the right to be left alone, which most people um, expect as part of their social due. There's not a whole lot left on that list, but abortion is one of the things. And one of the reason that abortion is such a thing is because it involves four issues which people often keep to themselves. Sex, bodies, medical treatment, and reproduction. So those are four areas that often um, people like to just, that's pri that are private matters. Now, we also have the fact that we know in this room that the Supreme Court anchored the right to abortion on the right to privacy. We tend to think of it that way as well. Um, and here I want to say there are relations between these different factors. And I want to just comment on the relation between sex and, um, sex and abortion. Because when you read the, the uh, judicial bypass cases or materials on, uh, books on them, of which there are a few good ones, um, you find out that what girls don't want their parents to know is that they were sexually active. The abortion is the least of their problems with regard to their parents. Their parents think that they're the kind of girl that they raised them to be. And the abortion or the pregnancy is the evidence that they weren't. And um, I talked to an advocate who takes girls in Tennessee to um, bypass cases. And she said she's driving the girl to the, to the court. And the, girl, and, um, and the girl's boyfriend was with her in the back seat. And the girl was just weeping and weeping. And the woman pulled the car over. And she said, listen, if you feel uncertain about this, you don't, have to, you, you don't have to go through this. You don't have to have a bypass hearing. And the girl said, that's not it. And the, the advocate said, well, what's the problem? And she said, I've never lied to my mother before. And she was lying by going to a court. She was lying by you know, telling her she was somewhere where she wasn't, and so on. So, so we have that. Now, um, OK, my argument here is that there's another way to describe all this non-disclosure. And that is not as privacy, but as secrecy. And secrecy suggests that it's better to keep some, a matter to yourself, not because you prefer to do so as an exercise of your agency, your autonomy, your free will, and so on, but because you are, um, if you don't, harm will follow. And keeping abortion secret is often a response to the threat or the um, perceived threat or the actuality of harm, whether uh, harassment, stigmatization, fear of violence, or loss of cherished relationships. These are real concerns. Um, clinic protesters armed with nothing more than smartphones have posted patients' pictures online, 
contacted the parents of pregnant minors, and sent patients hateful literature in the mail. In fact, for a while there was um, reverse reverse engineering of license plates. If you got someone's license plate, you could call the DMV and they would tell you, they would backtrack it um, and give you, give you the person's name. There was federal legislation called the Driver's Privacy Act to, to stop that practice. Um, so <clears throat> these are the kinds of things, oh, question, yeah. There's also the fact that having had an abortion doesn't, your fear about being exposed for that doesn't end right then. It lurks into the future. And so abortions have figured in um, political campaigns, in custody fights, where the husband has argued this is not a fit mother because she has had an abortion, and in um, employment applications. That was a terrible case about a woman applying for the police force who was uh, asked about questions which are illegal to ask, but they are asked. Um, and that's, that's very problematic. So the law itself recognizes the need for some secrecy around, um, around abortion. That is why Norma McCorvey, the real Jane Doe, was able to file her litigation as Jane Doe. And so I began thinking about that. I'm not a big civil procedure person, and, but I began thinking, how do you go into court and file under an anonymous name? What does it take? And so I began looking into it, and it turns out that the civil, rules of civil procedure allow you to file for an anon, for, uh, to uh, hide your identity and go in under, go in anonymously um, when, quote, the common threat is the presence of social stigma or the threat of social stigma and physical harm attaching to the disclosure of the identities. And then in one of the cases where they um, denied uh, two draft, uh, two conscientious objectors who didn't want to file for the draft during Vietnam, who wanted to go in under Doe. Court said, no, you can't. You're making a political statement. What's the point if nobody knows who you are? OK. But anyway, the court, <laughs> the court in, that, in that case said, um, mm, the court in that case gave a list of kinds of things that would qualify. Same-sex prison rape, mental illness, what the court, homosexuality, transsexuality, or abandoning your children. So you see where abortion fits. Um, what kinds of things are, dis, are, are worth protecting your identity from in this, in this um, uh, procedural context? Now, of course, um, Dawn, how long should I speak? Well, um, so at five up, a number of people have a class. Ah, OK. So um, I want to say that you know what? In like three more minutes, maybe. Pause. Yes. Okay. Okay, and I'll and I'll. Okay, and then when does everybody else go? I see that. Oh well, then I'm going to stop now. <laughs> just just about now, because I just want to show you. Um, so I think that when you when you go into a clinic and 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 there are protesters there, it's something like a civil ah, it's something like a civil version of the perp walk. You know, when they bring the guys out at the door so they can have their pictures taken. It's, it's criminal in its feeling that that's what you're doing. You're behaving like a criminal who has to hide, hide your face. Um, OK. Here's the end that I'm, that I'm just going to say very quickly. Um, I think that talking about abortion is a very hard thing to do. And the end of my chapter is called normalizing abortion. And by normalizing it, I don't mean trivializing it. I don't mean it's like a throwaway decision at all. But I mean, being able to talk to someone is, is tremendously important. And you have to choose your moment. You have to decide, when am I willing to confide something? And I think this goes for men as well as women, that men have been implicated. Certainly, men are implicated in most pregnancies and, the, and, <laughs> and, in most, and in most abortions, either as the cause for having have to have abortion or in agreement with it. And so in cooperation. And so I think that men are an under-tapped resource in arguing about how we might think of abortion as something that could be discussed. Um, so I won't say more than that. But my view is that if we talked about it at a social level, it would infiltrate, so to speak, public conversation. We'd have 
more movies, more tele not, not, not uncomplicated movies, but we would have more discussion, and that this would filter up, trickle up to the political conversation. Think about the fact that 30 years ago, being gay was both a, a, a mental illness, a medically diagnosable mental illness, and a crime. And in 30 years, we've come to where you could have gay neighbors, and they are married. Now, how did that happen? It happened in part by bravery of people stepping up. And I, I, you know, I've been accused of asking women to do too much. Like, they already had to go through an abortion. God, leave them alone. Well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not writing a manifesto. And I'm, I, I'm just saying there might be times when it seems appropriate to tell a little a junior cousin or talk to someone in your family and just see what happens. I don't believe that most people stop loving someone they care about or respect or admire because they've had an abortion. And my other view is grandmother should start talking up. Because two reasons. One, what have they got to lose? <laughs> Nothing, everyone loves them. And two, they're regarded as less or probably non-sexual. They're old people, you know, and so it's safe. They're not, they're not connected with sex, so that's a good thing. Okay, now here I just want to show you this. Why don't people leave who have to go? I see the pizza eaters already left, by the way. <laughs> I see where they sit. We have the same practice. Well, and we a round of applause, oh, no, no, no. I'm just going to show this one slide, and then I'll take questions. So this is one of the pictures I found. And as you can see, this is little baby Jesus. And this is John the Baptist. Both um, Mary and her cousin Anne were pregnant at the same time. And some of you may know, and it's beautiful, this whole tapestry. This is just a tiny fragment of it, but we, this is one of the panels. And, um, and so I just, I thought that was so interesting because, you know, they're fully formed. This was the view at the time that you were just waiting to be born, but you were ready. And um, there's a story here that some of you may know from Bible class, which is in Luke, um, when pregnant Anne passed by or was, you know, encountering and greeting pregnant Mary, little baby John the Baptist felt the presence of the Lord and jumped for joy. Sometimes it's say leapt for joy, but jumped for joy. And okay, that's, that's nice. And, <laughs> and, but here's the thing. So I thought, I, I, I think it's really interesting that we acknowledge fetus, fetal life at this early time. What, yeah, 1300, uh, 1410. And, um, and, and this leads to one other point. Many of us can understand identifying a fetus as a family member. Anyone who's had a wanted pregnancy feels like that. Some people with unwanted pregnancies feel that way. And so I don't think the, um, the pro-life advocates and believers and, and, and those who believe this, what, are not, they're not, what they believe is not crazy. You know, it's something we can, we can understand. And I think that's a very important thing to keep in mind. And I would urge it. But I don't think the counterpart goes as smoothly. I think it's very hard for people who oppose abortion always to understand what the cost is to women of, of, an, unwant, of an involuntary motherhood. But that's another lecture. OK, so anyway, I began. Oh, I'm supposed to stand in front of this, sorry. Uh, Yes, so I began looking up more about John the Baptist jumping for joy. And what I found was that in the years after the um, crucifixion, there, were there was competition for who was the real Messiah, who was actually going to form this new, um, this new faith. And the followers of John said John was the real Messiah. He was older. He was more... <laughs> able because he could jump and and he and you know Christ just sits there so so and and I began thinking about it that that was very interesting and then it dawned on me in a kind of an important moment that the fetus has always been political people have used the fetus 
throughout history as a, for political purposes, having nothing to do with motherhood, having nothing to do with unwanted pregnancies, but for, for the needs of, of a particular political movement. And so there are stories, there's a wonderful book called Imagining the Fetus, which is all religions and how they deal with fetus visually and, and stories. So there are little Jewish fetuses who sang after crossing the Red Sea. And then there's a very elaborate story about Buddha who in his mother was absolutely disgusted by all her fluids and exited by a side route, you know. So, so I mean, so I, it's fascinating to see that what we think we believe about the fetus is not, is, is a simple story. Um, okay, so that's really, um, yeah, so just one last thing about privacy that I'll say. I think we know that privacy is sometimes very important. Uh, pardon me, secrecy. We know we have trade secrets, we have pastoral secrets, we have lovers' pacts, we have all kinds of secrets, and we think they provide something to the people who've entered them. But what I'm concerned about is that it's no good for women to feel empowered in the context of abortion by exercising their privacy rights when secrecy is masquerading as privacy. And so I'll just stop there, and I'm very interested to answer questions or hear what you have to say. Thank yeah, do you want to call on people? Thank you, yeah. Um, I think um, if you want me to call on people, that'd be great. Sure, uh, but yeah. If you could repeat the questions you said people can't hear, that would be great. Sure. But everyone, speak up. Yes. Hi, um, I just, first I wanted to thank you. I teach a class in um, reproductive justice and reproductive technology and gender studies, so I cannot wait to read. Can we connect? Okay, so you have my, you can find me. Okay. Uh, and before I started, I want to say that I had an abortion. Um, I also had a miscarriage. I also had a human. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I had all of those things. Uh, and two things uh, I'm kind of fascinated um, by is part of my miscarriage, uh, I had a DMC after that, and I'm, I'm interested in some ways in the psychology of silences around miscarriage and silences oh, yeah. around abortion because when I was... I, I probably four people as I was signing into the hospital told me that they had had one too. It was like this compulsive sharing. And in some sense, that kind of DNC, I'm sure, can be culturally read as an innocent. So that was a wanted, that one was. Um, my other thing I'm just interested in is uh, as we get people talking more about using reproductive technology, and I'm thinking of lobbying groups like Resolve, um, who are heavily funded by large medical corporations for all the good work they do, that they, you know, that is a lot of their money. If that's going to start being more, that legislatively, if, if that's going to start turning the tide, because around at least people with money, white middle class people who want to have their embryos preserved, in the face of restrictive laws about personhood, I'm wondering if that industry is going to fuel more reproductive freedom, as it were. Again, it's all monetarily tied. But yeah. So um, on the on the miscarriage first, um, there's a wonderful book called What Was Lost. Do you know yeah. this? Great book by women writers about what what was lost. And so I think that so it's been a huge breakthrough and a very good book by. Lee, uh, Linda Lane called Motherhood Lost about miscarriage. So if anybody wants to work on that, is interested in that issue, those are two very good ones. Um, as, as for talking, I, what you said about women saying that they, um, as, as you have just done, I was very amazed. My book was reviewed in the New Yorker like on the day it came out. Like You want to wake up and feel like you're in heaven. That's what, that's, <laughs> that's what it feels like. And the best part was the woman goes on, she, she's read the book very carefully, and then she puts like an asterisk or something so that there's a pause, and then she describes an abortion she had 20 years ago. And I thought, I was just stunned. And she said, why has she never talked to anybody? She was very contemplative. And I... I I was I was kind of proud. Not that not that I think anybody has to reveal. Um, I was bumped into a friend on the street last week, and she says, "Carol, I just finished your book." I smile. She says, "And I call, I I went right to the phone and called my daughter, and told her that I'd had an abortion 25 years ago." <laughs> so this is not a manual. It doesn't come with like instructions of what you're supposed to do. 
It gives you things to think about. That's, that's its purpose. So I said, oh. And she said, and you know what she said to me? She said, Mom, if you felt that you have to unburden yourself, I'm very glad you called. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that, but, but as to the commercial interests, so this morning, at some horrible time, I had to read a dissertation on um, home pregnancy tests. <laughs> And the, the argument that the student was making, the grad student was making was, home pregnancy tests are thought to be very empowering for women. That they, it, you, you get to know before the doctor whether you're pregnant or not. That's nice. You don't have a whole office of people knowing your physical reproductive state. And you can think about it or you can wait. Okay, so, but she says, it's a more complicated story. She said, did I know? What, well, she says, does the reader know that <clears throat> the FDA wanted to regulate home pregnancy tests as a drug, but the manufacturers of home pregnancy tests lobbied very heavily to make sure that it wasn't. And then they passed something called the Medical Devices Amendment, which I had never heard of. And so, so this issue of money influencing and money, I mean, I don't exactly think Hobby Lobby is going to start you know, funding uh, reproductive technology, but that is an un that is a very undertold story. And I, um, when I studied, um, when I was wrote a piece on ultrasound, I, I was astonished to find out that manufacturers of ultrasounds tried to make them user friendly, like put soft edges on them, not hard edges. Some of their pastel, you know, they they're friend they're friendlier than they used to be. So thank, thank you for those questions. Okay. Yes, all the way back. Just a comment on the JRT. I know a lot of abortion doctors, and I know a lot of uh, reproductive physicians. That's my line of work as well. And what they do in the lobbying is they just carve out IVF from the abortion law. So they are very aware of each other. We have doctors who use selective reductions, right? Which is basically the same thing of abortion, and they pay the life. And uh, they just carve that out entirely. So very interesting, and it's 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 interesting how the same procedure mm -hmm. yep. is a DNC in one case if someone has a miscarriage, it's an abortion in another, and and this leads to doctor training, which is very important because people who are you, you may know there's something called the Coates Amendment, which says that hospitals and medical schools can opt out of um, having to train OBGYNs mm -hmm. in abortion procedures. I don't know. It's like it had to be a special amendment because according, you're not supposed to get federal funds unless you follow what the uh, particular um, department of in the, in, the, in the AMA requires for what a doctor should know. Yeah. Yes, yes. Right. You know, plenty of black women were arrested um, and prosecuted um, for drug use um, while they were pregnant. The apartment changed, no problem with that. Um, in fact, uh, the person who created the program went on to be attorney general, I believe, for um, the state of um, South Carolina. Um, second, I wonder if this going after doctors. Um, is part of, uh, I know we'll use a conspiracy theory, um, or a sinister plan to make sure that there aren't abortion providers, um, like the Codes Amendment, which you just mentioned. Um, it is increasingly difficult um, to stack, um, you know, abortion providers, you know, Jackson, right? Um, Jackson. So I wonder if that's part of the plan. Well, here we have another al alliance. So the medical profession has a lot to answer for, and in this way, in that you can, you know, you can opt out. In some schools, you have to opt in. It, it's even harder to sign up for that this 
training. Um, and the stigmatization from within the profession is great. And so when you read a book like Susan Wickland, who was a provider in Nebraska, I think, I can't remember the title of her book, it's a lonely life and a scary life. And um, that seems to me, and, and, and there's a historical reason why abortion providers got a bad reputation as abortionists, um, which is that abortions used to be done by anybody. And so there were famous, New York had a very famous abortionist, Madame Rastel. And you could read, you, if you read John Moore's book, Abortion in America, fabulous history of the, of the regulation of abortion, he explains the early regulation was to protect women's health and for doctors to get control of the business. But part of it was women's health. And, and, and so those, so they were the lowest of the doctors. But we're not there anymore. But we've kept the pejorative um, view that they're doing dirty work. And here's the thing. Dirty work, so here's the thing. You know who I mean by Tim Murphy? He was the Republican um, congressman in Pennsylvania who um, was whisked out of the House. You know, he said he'd stay till the next, till the term was over. They said, no, 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 out. Because he had his girlfriend, he's married, his girlfriend was married, and she exposed him with some texts, I think, about how they had a pregnancy scare. Not, she wasn't pregnant, but they had a pregnancy scare, and he said, you know, do you think abortion is an option? So she, she said, yeah, you're so busy. I, this is not what she said, but it's close. You, know, you're, you don't mind being 100% rating from the national right to life, but you're, you're, you want me to have an abortion. So he, and so he was regarded, everyone says, you know, he was regarded, this is hypocrisy, this is, you know, he's a hypocrite. And for my money, he's not so much a hypocrite. I don't care about that. I think that what, what his case shows you is no one thinks People have a view, I would never have an abortion. And people who think that have never been faced with a pregnancy that they regard as a calamity. And, and I think maybe that sounds ridiculous. How can pregnancy be a calamity? But it can. And, and in some cases, maybe the calamity can be overcome, but not in most. Your life changes if you, if in, this, in this way. Not if you have a wanted pregnancy, although your life changes then too. Um, so that... So that I thought that, yeah, as I said in the remarks yesterday, I'm not done with that guy because I think he's useful to show that it is a normal conversation to have. What are we going to do? Are we going to um, each get divorced and get married and live happily? I don't think so. You know, after after I leave my uh, my my seat in the house. So, yeah. <laughs>